Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Civica Data Science Seminar Series. And it is my honor today to introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Michelle Torres, who is an assistant professor of the Department of Political Science at Rice University. Michelle's interests lay in computer vision, causal inference, and survey methodology. Substantively, she focuses on political communication, participation, and psychological traits. And her research focuses on making statistical and computer science methods accessible to political scientists. She also develops and applies innovative and rigorous tools to achieve a better understanding of social issues, especially in the fields of political behavior and public opinion. She's going to present today uh, her research project, Framing Protests, Determinants and Effects of Visual Frames. And I just want to quickly remind uh, everyone who is with us today that this session and the seminar is being recorded. And uh, Michelle, the floor is yours. You can share your screen. Thank you. So um, first of all, I, I have to say thank you so much to Olga for inviting me to Civica for hosting me. Um, and for all of you who are here uh, to listen, what I have to say about protest and the way in which media frames them. Um, today, I'm going to talk a lot about images and, and, and visual content. Uh, this project, it's a long-term project that actually spans over three articles, and I'm going to talk a little bit about each of them during this talk. Um, I am interested basically in how to extract content uh, from images and photos of political events, um, understand uh, what kind of visual, visual messages are implied in these pictures, to then um, check what determinants or political factors are determining what we as an audience see, um, and finally how those uh, visual uh, elements affect the formation of political attitudes and opinions. So uh, I'm really looking forward to your comments, feedback, uh, reactions, uh, so please feel free to, to, to engage with that. So uh, just to give you a bit uh, of the motivation behind this project, I'm going to show you these headlines that were published in May 3rd of 1963 in local US newspapers. These headlines are talking about a protest that happened in Birmingham, Alabama in the context of the civil rights movement. If we read some of them, hundreds held in racial show, nearly 700 arrested as 2000 watch, we get a bit of information of what happened during these events, right? If we go back actually and read the article, the full article of these headlines, we get a similar flavor. Apparently there were a lot of people in this protest, there were some arrests, but beyond um, uh, these arrests, uh, the, the, uh, the text generally said that the protests were pretty, pretty peaceful and that there were not a lot of eventful things to report. However, this is the image that uh, the New York Times posted in its front page when talking about this protest. And this image is telling us a different story from what we could get from the text. Um, this is a very violent depiction of a dog attacking a teenager, apparently under the command of the police. And although there's a full story about uh, the background and the story of this picture, uh, uh, I want you to focus on what you're seeing. And beyond the feelings of um, impotence and anger that this picture might trigger, um, uh, the important thing for me is that it's exactly putting under the spotlight the, the demands, the main demands and, and, and like complaints of the civil rights movement, which is discrimination and violence against African Americans. A very powerful picture that is considered to be a catalyzer of, of the movement, of the civil rights movement, first of all, because it reached international audiences and communicated a bit about the the things that were happening in terms of racial tension in America in a moment where the US was trying to win hearts and minds broad. Internally, it also mobilized elite um, and, and public opinion that um, slowly started aligning more with the movement's demands and that started pushing for policy change, which in my view, it's um, led to one of the biggest transformations, if not the biggest transformation in terms of policy and political landscape in, in the United States. So one picture, uh, with this enormous ability of changing hearts, changing minds, uh, and, and triggering a lot of positive change. And this is, of course, not limited to, to images in the US. We can also think about images uh, like this um, that are very relevant in the international landscape uh, about immigration, about war, uh, about poverty, that um, are able to mobilize people in the right direction. Um, but uh, I don't want you to think that uh, the impact of these images is limited to these very intense and powerful images. Um, actually, we can have other milder ones like this one, who, uh, which was um, uh, published uh, or like posted by Barack Obama in a tweet 
<clears throat> right after the nationalist protest in Charlottesville, uh, paired with the quote from Nelson Mandela that no human being is born hating another human being on the basis of its uh, skin color, background, or religion. So a uh, very powerful and cute image uh, conveying this, this, uh, and this nice message of unity, diversity, while also portraying the very charismatic personality of one of its actors. So the main takeaway from these pictures is that um, they can help us to tell a story and more specifically they can tell us they can help us to frame a story and these visual frames are going to be critical to understanding media communication first of all because images are very powerful drivers of emotions emotions that in turn uh, shape cognitive processes deep cognitive and unconscious processes that eventually lead to attitude formation and attitude change. Um, uh, further, image processing is way easier than other sources like text that require more skills and sophistication like literacy. But for me, the most important thing is that Im images can provide information that goes beyond language. We are using images to tell different stories, to frame uh, stories in, in different ways. And just to be clear what I mean when I say visual frame, uh, I refer to these visuals that an actor uses to relay information and that reveals what she wants you to see, what she considers important from a particular event uh, to communicate to you. Um, uh, and uh, this is connected to the idea that content matters, of course, what, what's implied in these images matters, but also how that content is presented is also going to be important to frame a story. So to give you an idea of how these visual frames operate in the real world, I'm going to show you four different newspaper covers that pu were published in May 30 of last year. Uh, they are talking about the protests that happened uh, in the context of, of, of George Floyd's uh, death. Um, and the interesting thing that these front pages have is that they all have the same uh, text uh, taken from a newswire source, the Associated Press, uh, but the different things between them are just the picture and the headline. So uh, in this case, we see the protesters gathering at night, um, but in a very peaceful manner, just like um, uh, listening or, or like organizing in the crowd. Uh, here we see a bit more of tension, right? There was a police, a strong police presence there and a heavily armed police presence. Here we see already some tension between this heavily armed police and the protesters. And here we see absolute chaos, definitely the culmination of a really violent night. So the main takeaway from this uh, pictures is that they are not only telling us different stories, but more like different parts of the same story. Uh, and this is what I mean when I'm talking about this visual framing. So this leads and motivates my questions for this, this project, uh, this big project that I have, which is how can we identify and measure this visual framing? Uh, whether political factors like ideology are associated with the generation of the visual frames of protest. And finally, whether visual frames impact opinions and attitudes towards social movements. And this talk is going to be heavily focused on the second and third question. But in order to understand um, a part of that, that question, I need to talk a little bit about the first one. Um, and because I know you are all a Method C crowd, I will talk to you a bit about the method that I'm using to identify visual framing. So um, how can we identify and measure, and measure visual framing? Um, if I want to answer that question, I need to tell you a bit more about the challenges in the analysis of images. Um, and first of all, we need to remember that we are constantly bombarded by images. We have these large amounts of pictures and photos that really complicate and slow down the task of coding and classifying them. But even if you manage to get an army of research assistants uh, that can classify and code your pictures, then we have the problem that it is really hard to define and standardize coding schemes. But even if you do that, then you face the challenge that coding images or classifying them is very sensitive to coder subjectivity and cognitive filters. But if you look at all of these uh, challenges, then uh, you realize that they are very similar to the challenges that we also face with text. And yet we have managed to overcome them in that area. So my question here is whether we can do something similar to what we do with text, use similar methods, uh, but now with images. And the answer is, well, maybe we can emulate the very popular bag of words uh, that helps or is the basis for multiple analyses in, in text analysis and, and have something like a bag of visual words. And the bag of visual words for images, it's a tool that I am borrowing from computer science, which is basically a series of steps to reduce the dimensionality of the image, uh, tokenize them, and make them interpretable for further analysis. It consists on identifying key points in the images, extracting features from these key points so the computer can understand um, 
what like a collection of pixels mean. And then we're gonna create a visual code book because unlike text, we don't have words or sentences or engrams that we can take as tokens. And finally, we're gonna build an image visual word matrix that is gonna be very similar to the document term matrix in text. So the key point detection step is very intuitive. We're just interested in identifying salient regions, edges and corners in the image. Um, there are multiple ways of doing it. Uh, I am using a fast Hessian, which is very popular. And the idea is that once you identify these key points uh, and you plot them in this case, for example, with green dots, you can definitely see that the key points are, are aligning along the edges of uh, really important features. And these features tell us something about the objects that we're finding in these images. And these objects are in turn telling us something about the content or the uh, underlying message of, of the picture. <clears throat> Once we have these key points, uh, we're going to use a descriptor to extract pictures from them. Multiple ways of extracting the descriptors um, and extracting features. I'm here also using a very common and popular one called the root sift. And the idea is that I am defining um, this feature extraction process in the following way. I am defining a feature as the changing pixel intensity in a grayscale image. And I'm going to quantify this changing pixel intensity with a gradient magnitude and orientation basically a histogram of gradient magnitudes and orientation. So the way in which it works is that if I have a picture um, and then I have all of my key points like here, uh, let's focus on this guy, this little guy surrounded by the red, red square. We are gonna take that key point. We're gonna take the 16 times 16 pixel neighborhood around that key point. We're gonna overlay a grid of uh, four times time four, four times four cells uh, in, this, in this neighborhood. So we're gonna have 16 cells um, uh, in the neighborhood of this, of this key point. And then in each of these cells, we're gonna do the following. We're basically gonna see how the pixel intensity is changing along the X and along the Y direction. So in this case, along the X direction, if we focus on this uh, pixel, we see that there's no change because it's coming from white to white. But in contrast, if we focus on the change in the Y direction, we see that this is the strongest change that it could happen from 255 to zero, from white to black. Right, so uh, we are going to represent all of these pixel intensities in each of our cells with uh, with vectors or, or gradients, telling us how is this pixel intensity changing, and then we are going to uh, represent or summarize all of these uh, changes and magnitudes with a histogram. The histogram is going to have in the x-axis all the possible um, orientations collapse into eight bins, and then the height of the histogram is going to be the magnitude of this change. So the idea is that for each of these cells, we're going to have a histogram that we are then going to flatten or concatenate. And at the end, each of the green uh, key points that you saw in the pictures is going to be represented with is going to be represented with a vector of 128 elements corresponding to eight bins per histograms times 16 cells. So once we have these features extracted for each of these key points, uh, then we need to define our visual vocabulary. And again, this is important because if you think about images, we are not able to find very concrete tokens. We can't say like in text, oh, this is a word or this is a sentence. So we basically need to create or provide some references to identify some of these features. Um, so what we're gonna do is like, this is a cartoonish example. Suppose that I identify those key points in the images, I extracted the features, meaning uh, a vector of 128 elements per key point. I am mapping them into my, into my multidimensional space. And then I'm gonna cluster all of these features. And the centroid of each cluster is gonna represent my visual world. Why am I doing this? So if now um, I'm able to see you all guys and take pictures of your faces, uh, and then I apply these key points, um, I'm probably gonna find like little, little pieces of eyes and noses and mouth. Um, and uh, the thing is that in images are uh, just like in, in real life, right? Like my eye is going to be really different from Olga's eye or my nose is going to be really different from Pui's nose. And the idea with clustering is that we take the average of like this concept. Like we're saying, well, this cluster of patches, they are, very, they are different. They are not identical, but they look they look as similar. They are like following a very similar pattern in terms of pixel intensity change. So I'm gonna take the mean of that, of that uh, cluster and I'm gonna use it as a reference of what it could represent a nose or an eye, for example. So mathematically, um, a visual word is the centroid of a cluster, right? So it's also a 128 um, element vector. 
intuitively it's a cluster of mini patches it's like the cluster of the neighborhoods around the key points that we extracted um, and that all belong together or that have the same membership to the cluster so this is a visual word with uh, crowds like pieces of crowds or dense dense groups this is a visual word um, with pieces of signs from the protest and this is a visual word with like close-up images right we can see more faces uh, and we can see like body parts so now that we create our visual codebook, we can um, create our image visual matrix that is the basis of this bag of visual words. Um, just as a reminder, the idea is to emulate a document term matrix in text. And this is how the document term matrix in text looks like. We have a uh, text in rows. We have the words that appear in each row uh, in the column. And then we're gonna count the number of times that each of these words in the columns are appearing in the rows. So in this case, uh, black appears one time here, matter, one in this case protest it's appearing two times in the second row etc etc so the idea is to have um to emulate this documentary matrix but with the images the images in rows the visual words that we created in columns and then to see how many times each of these visual words is appearing in each of the images so um once we have that matrix we can basically do whatever we want with it um i wouldn't recommend anything uh, like oriented to a very specific or concrete uh, supervised issue or supervised classification problem, um, because there are other tools that are much more suitable for that. But if, for example, you want to do something unsupervised or that requires, uh, or that you are envisioning more, more like a clustering or like a topic model thing, then it would be perfect. And I'm going to give you an example. So. Quick refresher, we build a big, uh, the, the, the bug of visual words approach reduces the dimensionality of the pictures. We extracted features and turn them into visual words that serve as reference. We build this document matri term matrix style input. And then um, what I'm gonna do in my particular case to, 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 to measure or to identify visual frames is that I am interested in identifying topics in my images. And for that, I'm going to use a structural topic model, uh, very popular among political scientists because it was created by political scientists uh, and it's awesome. It's an awesome method. And it's a tool uh, for topic modeling of text uh, that includes document level covariate information. Um, it's basically a mixture model, very similar to a latent Dirichlet allocation, an LDA uh, model. Uh, and it gives you probability that words belong to each of the topics that you are interested in or, or that you identified. Um, and the nice thing is that it's not a single uh, classification outcome, right? Like you have proportions for all the potential topics in your corpus by document. So the idea is that if you have an image and you run structural topic model and you find, let's say, six topics like sky, crowd, pavement, and flag, then you will be able to have a proportion of each of these topics per image. So you are not just going to say, oh, look, uh, uh, you're not going to run a classifier to say, this is a crowd, or there's a flag in here. You're also going to get the proportion of these topics that we are finding in the images, and I will be equating these topics to visual frames. So once I have identified and measured these visual frames, I can proceed and answer the question of whether political factors like the ideology of the news outlets are associated with the generation of visual frames. And I'm going to focus on a dimension of, of framing, which is uh, the mood and environment of a movement. Um, uh, here we can see how this might be operating. You have these um, gloomy, dark kind of tense environment with some clashes between the police and the protesters, or at least some anxiety and some tension between them. Whereas in this picture at the bottom, you have um, this crowd, open space, very colorful happening in the middle of the day that is probably more inviting. Um, and these differences are actually relevant because the literature in, in social movements and political geography uh, puts a lot of importance of place and context in shaping protest actions and in shaping protest success. So night, for example, is considered a politically dangerous and impractical time space. I know that night, it's a time of the day, but because of its characteristics, it also shapes the space in which a particular event um, takes place. Um, and it is considered dangerous and impractical for multiple reasons. First of all, logistics, right? It poses some challenges 
uh, because the bosses are not running that often, because you have your kids at home and you don't have a babysitter to look uh, for them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it also, uh, night is also associated with these feelings of vulnerability because it's dark and you can't see, and then you feel like you're clumsier and then you are not as sharp. Uh, it, it increases your feelings that you're unsafe and you're not able to protect yourself. And finally, there's also like this very natural association of night and crime, you know, like when the sun goes down, the criminals come out. Uh, so for those reasons, we, um, uh, well, the literature uh, considers night to not be a great, a great uh, time space uh, for protest success because it discourages mobilization. And the question here is like, well, who is interested in discouraging mobilization or portraying this protest as more negative or as more unsafe? Um, and the literature and in, in media communication and, and social movements also points out that the conservative uh, outlets are more likely to do so because protests do not align with principles that are typically considered conservative, right? Like the preservation of the status quo, law and order and patriotism. So here my expectation is that conservative, more conservative news outlets are going to have higher incentives to depict protests as dangerous and risky with the idea of discouraging mobilization, and therefore they are going to use a higher proportion of a night activity frame. And to test this expectation, what I did is that I collected uh, around 2,000 images from 3,500 front pages of local US newspapers during the Ferguson riots and now during the new wave of protests related to George Floyd. Um, I have uh, these three dates for the Ferguson riots in 2014 and for the BLM protests now in 2020, uh, I collected uh, these front pages from May 29 to June 2nd. Uh, the bag of visual awards that I created um, uh, it, well, I'm, I'm using the approach, and, and first of all, I am creating a codebook that I generate from 20,000 images or to around 21,000 images from Getty. Why am I doing this? Why am I using all of these images from Getty with the uh, uh, label or tag uh, protest, like Black Lives Matter protest? My idea is that I want my codebook to be very comprehensive and to include as many frames as possible. And because Getty uh, collects all of these images from multiple photographers, multiple sources, and multiple organizations, my idea is that they are basically um, uh, increasing the chances that we get the full picture of what happened uh, uh, during those days. So basically, the idea is that if we were going to stitch all of these images from Getty together, we will get a really good um, um, picture or image of what happened of what happened um, during those protests. So then I'm creating this code book based on that sample. And then I'm going to have a separate sample with my front with my images from my front pages that I will compare to this code book to, to see what like the proportion of those of those um, uh, pro, uh, of those uh, frames are happening in my corpus of interest. And for that, I run a structural topic model with 15 topics and uh, ideological slant and year as prevalence covariates. Um, I am interested in one, testing whether ideology has an impact on these generation official frames. And I'm using um, year to see if there are differences between the 2014 and the 2020 um, protests. And some of the topics I identified are crowds, fire, smoke, uh, individuals, police science, but I'm going to focus on this visual frame of night activity that I talked about in the previous slide. So if I tell STM to give me the most representative images per topic, this is what I get. Uh, and as you can see, this means that these images have a high proportion of the night activity topic or, or of the night activity frame. And um, you can see what the computer is seeing, right? It's looking at dark backgrounds and basically like splashes of light uh, on top of, of dark backgrounds, uh, like in this case, the fire or the smoke or the lights. So that's what the uh, pixel intensity change uh, pattern is, is like what the computer is picking up from, from these images. So um, here in this graph, I'm going to put the newspaper in the x-axis and in the y-axis, I have the mean proportion of topic night activity for all of the pictures that these newspapers had in their front page in both, in both waves of the protest. Um, and as you can see, there's like an important variation. Um, uh, the Newsday is basically posting images with almost zero uh, percent of uh, topic night activity, meaning they are probably publishing just the images with uh, with uh, daytime protest, whereas the Washington Post has a much higher, much higher, um, more than 20 percent of their pictures have this um, night activity frame. Um, <clears throat> if I uh, analyze uh, and test this expectation of the 
the, the, the correlation or, or the, the relationship between this variation and ideology. Here is what I get in the x-axis ideological slant of the newspaper ranging from liberal to conservative. On the y-axis is the mean proportion of this topic night activity um, for all of the pictures uh, that they published. And as we see here, there is a positive and reliable relationship between these two variables indicating that the more conservative a newspaper um, is, the higher the proportion of night activity topic they are going to use in, in their in their photos, in the photos they publish about the Black Lives Matter movement. This, of course, and all of this theory that I talk about is assuming that we have a left-leaning left -leaning protest. So now I jump to the question of whether visual frames impact opinions and attitudes towards social movements. Um, and for that, I'm going to focus in another dimension or another element of the mood and environment frame, which is violence. And visual violence is particularly important beyond time space uh, for protest mobilization and for protest success because it builds perceptions of legitimacy. It has this potential of activating emotional responses, motivate unconscious reactions of anxiety, opposition, empathy, or denial. So it's like a crucial thing considered as an element uh, that shapes uh, people's opinions towards social movements. <clears throat> and I'm going to focus on two, two, two elements here on whether the protest is depicted as violent versus peaceful, but also if, if it's violent, what's the source of the violence, if it's a protester or if it's the, the police. Um, and I have like several hypotheses here uh, based on like this combination of violence and source of violence. Basically, I'm expecting that if there's a violent, um, um, that, that, that if, if you see a visual, if you see a violent picture of the protest, um, you are going to be more likely to have a negative opinion of it if the violence is committed by the protester. But you might uh, sympathize more with the movement if the violence is committed by the by the police. Um, this is operating in this way. Um, if you see more violence committed by the protester, you think that you have a higher likelihood or chance of getting arrested. So that increases your costs of joining the movement or sympathizing or supporting them. Whereas if you see violence by the police, you, based on repression theory, you think that then uh, that's going to make uh, the, the objectives um, of the protesters more achievable because uh, you can put some pressure on the government to attend their protests, uh, their demands. Um, uh, also, if you see more violence by the protesters, you are going to be less likely to identify with them because then you're going to see them as an outsider. It's like, no, I'm not a violent person. I, I'm not identifying with them. But in contrast, if you see violence by the police, then there's uh, repression theory also tells us that there's more likelihood of feeling empathy or compassion for the victims, which in this case is a protester. And therefore, you're going to share their views in a higher degree and sympathize more with the movement. So to test this hypothesis, I have a sample of 2,000 respondents from Lucid. Um, basically, I did a, a survey experiment where I provided my respondents with a newspaper article about talking about multiple protests uh, happening throughout the country that turned violent. Important thing here, uh, I am not using the Black Lives Matter movement for this example. I am using the Occupy uh, Wall Street uh, movement protest, um, basically because in the moment where I was trying to do these experiments, people were overly treated with images, text, news about the Black Lives Matter movement. So their, their positions were basically already determined by all of this content. Whereas with the Occupy movement, it was like, some time ago, so people didn't have it so fresh in their minds. Some of them didn't even know what it was. So it was a good, um, a good example to actually test how this this visual content, and verbal content, is shaping opinions. So I have a control condition that is just giving uh, the respondents the vignette with the text, uh, and I have different treatments. One that includes a picture with no no violence, so no visual violence treatment. Then I have a picture that includes a violent protester, and then I have another picture that includes a violent police. And I have several outcomes to evaluate these negative or positive attitudes toward the movement and oriented towards evaluating um, uh, people's evaluations of the police response, perceptions of success of the movement, identification with protesters, and also future engagement with the idea of like measuring how much these things are affecting participation. <clears throat> so this is the vignette from the control condition. It's trying to emulate this newspaper 
um, article without the identifier of where it's coming from. Um, and it just has a text, again, mentioning that there were several protests and that they, they went by. This, the, the, the peaceful protest condition has exactly that same vignette, but it also had embedded an, an, a peaceful protest image, uh, which is this one. The violent protester condition had this one embedded, and the violent police condition had this one um, as well. And here are the results. In the x-axis, uh, you will see the treatment effect. In the y-axis, you will see the different outcomes that I had. And for the different outcomes, I just basically asked my respondents um, how much they agreed or how strongly they agreed with uh, several statements, including hey, the movement is gonna achieve their objectives. I share the views with the protesters. I will get involved with a similar movement to this movement um, and the police went too far. So level of agreement with these statements. And all of the results that I'm gonna present here um, are based on um, the control condition as the baseline category. So as we see here, uh, the violent protester and the violent police conditions are um, having a negative effect on the perceptions that the movement will achieve their objectives. Um, and it's interesting because even though this violent protester condition is confirming uh, my hypothesis that a violent protester is gonna uh, make your opinion more negative in multiple dimensions about a social movement, uh, the result from the violent police is going against what I was expecting. And you will see that same pattern throughout the results. So the violent police and the violence protester has in general a negative effect in almost all the outcomes I have. So regardless of who's committing the violence, um, either the police or the protester, um, people tend to have a, a, like a more negative opinion of the movement and are less likely to engage with it. Um, so this suggests that it's more a, a theory of costs. Uh, if you know that you can get hurt or if you know that you can get arrested, regardless of whether it's fair that the police is attacking or not, then you're going to be more hesitant to support the movement. Um, however, something interesting here is that uh, the protester pays a higher a higher uh, cost for being violent, whereas the police uh, still has the benefit of the doubt. And that's something that I also see in the pilots. Like when you put up an image of the violent police, people's first reaction is always like, but we don't know what happened before that. Like there's always this uh, tendency to, to believe that the police has a monopoly of the force and that they are justified to sometimes act in violent, in violent ways because the protester might deserve it. Um, so this is this is what I'm finding in general. The only result that it's kind of in line with what I was expecting is this one. If you see the violent uh, police frame, then you are more likely to evaluate the, the the response of the police as too extreme or going too far. Um, and also uh, here you can see it, but some of these differences, uh, most of them uh, between violent protester and violent police, are also. Uh, different reliably different from zero so that we, we are definitely finding these differential effects there. so just to conclude images are powerful and abundant elements of frames the measurement and analysis of these components um, uh, is and are crucial to have a better understanding of how political communication and attitude formation are interacting uh, i find that conservative outlets are more likely than liberal outlets to depict protest in more dangerous and riskier time places and i also find in the, in the second study that the visual portrayal of the source and level of violence in a protest affect attitudes towards the movement um, so coming soon i also want to see what's the interaction between text and images um, if uh, you provide more information um, through text or through the image people's responses are different my hunch is that uh, the image is just a heuristic that that people are always gonna gonna take and um, like because it's more like a seed to believe are gonna are gonna put a higher weight on how they build their perceptions um, but I'm also interested on the mechanisms behind this attitude formation um, and uh, because of the pandemic I had to stop some 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 projects but the idea was to use some eye tracking technology to really see what people were focusing on when they were digesting these images um, I need to do some heterogeneous treatment effect analysis but I need to have bigger samples and all, uh, also to focus on other types of protest. As, as I said, this was all assuming a left-leaning protest or with um, left-leaning um, objectives, uh, but it will be also interesting to see how, whether the topic, if it's, for example, nationalism, actually um, affects the way in which conservative news outlets are covering, are covering those events. Um, sources of images, social media versus regular media, and also measuring media bias. And with that, um, thank you so much for 
for, for your time and for your attention. And I will look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you so much, Michelle. We have one question in the Q&A session so far. Uh, well, it's like a, several questions actually from uh, Fahrad Miller. Um, so what do you think about the relationship between the visual content and the headline of the news article attached with it? And do you also take into account the political leaning of the newspapers themselves? Um, so for the first one, I honestly haven't done anything with the headline yet because uh, they, in, in this case, um, sometimes my, my impression is that it didn't provide that much information or, or was generally uh, pretty much in line with with uh, with what the main text was saying. Uh, so I don't have a lot of a lot of uh, evidence or beyond my anecdote, like checking all of these newspaper covers. Um, but it, my impression was that it was it was definitely the, the really contrasting thing or the ways in which we could see more and more variation or stronger differences was uh, with the picture. Uh, but that's something that. Uh, I've been talking to Olga uh, a lot, right? Like how how are these things uh, working? If we were to train an algorithm to describe the image, whether we could get something similar to the caption or the headline, for example. And uh, uh, I don't think we will get something very similar. It, it's also gonna be a lot of variance there and something that it's not very factual, but more editorial. But um, that, that's what I what I can say about that. And for the political ideology of the newspaper, yes, uh, the measure of ideological slant is actually a measure of, of political ideology of the of the newspaper. It's basically, and, and, and I'm saying political ideology because it's constructed um, based on this method by Gens Quen Shapiro in which they are trying to compare how these newspapers are talking when they are publishing uh, news articles and compare that to how uh, Democrats and Republicans in Congress talk. So basically trying to, uh, it's based on like the similarity measures of how politicians from the left and from the right and from the liberals and conservatives are talking to map newspapers into that, um, into that language. Uh, so it is a measure of political ideology of the newspaper. Okay, thank you, Michelle. We have another um, couple questions. Uh, first block of questions is from uh, Ken Benoit. Uh, so could you please explain again, how are the images parsed into visual words? Uh, and also even more than words, visual tokens. Uh, visual tokens are uh, contagious with other potential words and two-dimensional, uh, not just linear space. And is this con contingency and context used in any way? Sure, so I can go back to, so how we're tokenizing the images basically. If, if my PDF allows. Um, Okay, so here it is. So the idea is that first we're gonna identify the key points. And this is actually for, for Ken, this would be like almost like a stop word removal uh, because we might not be super interested in a lot of the background or a lot, like if you're taking a picture with a green um, background in the back, uh, then you might not be interested in, well, in checking absolutely every single area of that background. So the idea with this, with this, uh, um, uh, key point identification is to is to get like a cleaner uh, a cleaner first step uh, for the feature extraction and also to make the process a little bit less burdensome in terms of computational power. So once you identify the key points, then you focus on each of these key points. Um, and uh, this one, for example, is one of them. We take the neighborhood uh, around them, the sixteen times sixteen pixel neighborhood around each of these key points. We put this grid on top. And what we're gonna do is that for each of these grids, we're gonna focus on how the pixel intensity is changing. So this red square is basically a filter that is gonna slide uh, throughout the cell. And we're gonna see at each of these pixels, we wanna see how the pixel intensity around it is changing from uh, and the, in the X direction and the Y direction. So this is just basically like, if you have a corner, for example, the pixel intensity change is gonna be very, uh, very specific. And um, it's gonna be very similar to other corners that you find in the image. So the, the, to represent this pixel intensity change in this cell, we're gonna use these vectors, right? So in this case, this vector is telling us basically all the pixel intensity change in this cell is happening downwards, right? 
and, and it makes sense. It's coming from black, uh, from white to black. So then we're just gonna collapse the information about that pixel intensity into, into these histograms, and we're gonna concatenate them for each of these key points. So that's a feature extraction. For the actual token, what we're gonna do is just gonna cluster all of these features. Um, and granted, uh, that's something that I should have said before. There's a lot of discretion on how many key points, for example, you want, how many um, clusters uh, you want, um, but the centroid of each cluster is gonna represent that visual word. So it's gonna be, the visual word is represented by a vector of 128 elements. Um, and when we analyze what type of mini key points belong to each cluster, we can actually build these visual words intuitively or we can visualize them. So uh, these were all the pictures, all, all of the mini patches belonging to one of the clusters. And the center of that cluster was the actual input that we take to estimate the differences between, between the key points and the visual words. I don't know if that makes sense. Okay, well, I guess if, if there are going to be some additional questions from Ken, he probably will put, oh, okay. So, well, he, he has additional question. Is the size of this clustering or the key point identification process uh, something that has to be adjusted for each image? Not for each image, for, but for each corpus. And in the code that I develop, actually, because the, I'm borrowing all of this from the computer scientists, but it's impressive how little they care about some of these decisions. <laughs> so uh, in the code that I developed for, to share with social scientists, I actually add an extra step where um, you basically test different sizes of key point detection. Um, the key point detection, if you change the Hessian threshold, um, you will be able to detect more or less. So if, in your particular problem, you care about retaining much more information and many more key points, then you can change that parameter to your particular objectives, but not at the image level, but at the corpus level. Uh, if you instead care much more about like very salient objects, then you can increase that threshold and just retain a lower amount of key points. So that's one decision that you can make at the corpus level. For the... Um, Clustering, it's the same. Um, I, I always say that uh, you, like substantive knowledge really needs to guide this and like a deep knowledge of your data. Um, so sometimes if your idea is like, kind, you have a, a very good idea of what you're expecting to find, let's say crowds, like the topic of crowd in the image, um, then maybe you don't need that many that many clusters or that many visual words because they are going to pop out right really easily. But if maybe you are more interested in finding distinction between crowd uh, day and crowd at night, then you probably need to increase the size of your vocabulary, the size of clusters that you have in the clustering step um, to get to get more of this variation or to capture a bit more of those differences. So there's there's definitely uh, some discretion there but everything is happening at the corpus level. And the nice thing is that you can always visualize it, right? Like you can always get the visual vocabulary and go back and see what kind of visual words you're getting. You can always go back and like run some um, elbow plots uh, to visualize an optimal number of clusters naturally. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a very strong uh, feature of this method because I am fully aware that this is very far from being a convolutional neural network and I could a lot of pushback for that, but this has the super nice advantage of always tracing and visualizing every part of the process to do even these validation exercises that I think are crucial for, for any classification in general, but particularly for images. Okay, awesome. So we have a couple of questions from Maverick2636. If your evidence suggests a general aversion to violence, regardless of the source of violence within the picture, do you think this effect cross into political context outside of the US? And related to that question, do you have any references to literature on this topic with similar methodologies in uh, methodology in the Middle East? Um, uh I, so I am an Americanist <laughs> and I am not in charge, to be honest, like all of, all of the things um, that this is based on is uh, based on repression theory, for example. So Chung is a, a fantastic, uh, a, a fantastic reference to go back and, and, and like get to know more about like these dynamics and social movements. Um, 
and and the idea will operate similar in other contexts. Like I think there's an assumption here that it will operate in in in, in similar contexts because it has some um, psychological uh, background or like core here to saying like, hey, if you see someone suffering, then you're gonna be more likely to be like, no, I I I I, w- I want to be more empathic or I, I want to develop some empathy towards you or I am compassionate, and that's pretty universal. I don't think that's assuming anything about Americanist uh, or like American people, for example. Um, so all of these underpinnings um, or like concepts underlying this theory are quite universal, uh, but I don't know how they will operate in other contexts. Uh, the, like everything that I knew and everything suggested that I was gonna find these differential effects and I didn't. Um, it could also be that it's a type of, of stimuli that I'm using here. Maybe this is uh, affecting this likelihood of participation, but it's not considering other things like just donating for the to, to the movement, for example, right? Like this requires a more active, active participation of like going to the protest and putting your body there with the idea that you might potentially get hurt so maybe the question was not will you join the movement and will you will will you go to the protest but more like will you donate to this movement or what do you think about um uh, contributing in other ways to the cause so so probably it's a combination of i am not capturing the right the right uh, outcomes and i am using uh, a stimulus that really highlights this part of you might get hurt or you might get arrested um, so, so this is just to say, I I still think there's there's a lot, a lot of truth in 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 the repression theories or like the thresholds of of violence that people can accept and that can mobilize them. I actually think that what happened with George Floyd was um, was evidence of what we were expecting. We saw violence. We saw so vividly how how he was uh, tortured and murdered that that people people activate and were like, I don't care if it, there's a pandemic, I'm gonna go out. So um, again, this is just, this, this, this experiment, for example, was, was uh, conducted before that happened. So there are still a lot of things uh, to be said and um, it would be interesting to see it also in other contexts. Okay, uh, we have a um, slightly different question from um, Anneli Casanueva Artis. Um, Regarding the photos on night, could the fact that less quality photos could seem less at night, like super exposed, for example, and can create some bias for your results? And for and also newspapers that have less budget for images, they could uh, have different characteristics than those that have more budget. Could it be worth to compare newspapers of the same kind, uh, for example, with more or less less of the same budget? Um, um, I guess the idea is like maybe some high quality pictures are more expensive and uh, that kind of can bias your results as well. So what can you say about that? That's Those are great questions. So for the quality, um, I, I had the, the exact same uh, concern, especially at the beginning of this project, I was working with Facebook data. And with Facebook, the variation in the quality, and the size of the pictures was enormous. Like you had a super pixelated thumbnail and then you had a really high resolution image that was really nice uh, to analyze. And I ran some tests there to see how much my results were changing uh, based on like excluding, for example, the pixelated ones um, uh, or creating a, a version of the, of like a high quality version of that one. Um, and, and the variation was, was minimal. However, it really broke when it was really, really pixelated or really, really bad. So in that case, I was, I was, I definitely always had to say, we need to be cautious. Some of these images look more like a, yes, like a thumbnail that was like really bad. And when you run the topic model, you actually had a topic of pixelated images because they were so bad that you couldn't detect what, what was happening there. Um, but uh, uh, it had to be a really bad resolution. However, for these analyses, um, because the images are coming from the newspaper, from pages PDFs, actually they have a really good uh, resolution. And the, I, I checked the variation even uh, between all of those, like the same image, but used by different newspapers. And they all look pretty similar in terms of size and and. And shape. They are normalized and they are also resized to have the, the same dimensions before this process starts. So that also alleviates some of the concerns. Regarding exposure and illumination and some of those things, um, there's not a lot that I can do, uh, but but I don't think that's very, the method is very sensitive to those part, like milder, milder changes. Um, for the second one with the budget, I totally agree. And uh, something that 
it's related. It's like, well, th this newspaper might be might not have enough resources, but still want to. And I don't know, it's in Idaho, and they really want to, to cover the protest in St. Louis. How? What are they going to do? They have all of these news wire sources, right? Um, and and. And it could be the question of like, well, maybe they are not even deciding to post the images themselves. They, they, they just didn't have a choice because they received one image from the Associated Press. But they actually have some discretion uh, to use them. Um, I'm trying to go to my appendix to show you that in, in, in the images they are using, um, for, for especially for 2014, most of these images were coming from... Um, from the Associated Press, from Getty, from Newswire sources. So there was some like we were in a way naturally controlling <laughs> for that. So so I, I am not concerned about that. With the 2020, there's definitely more variation because the protests were way more local. So the, you definitely could see that they sent their own photographer and took like, if it was a little town, it was like a, like a very a very nice picture of all, like 20 people in the town protesting. So there was definitely more variation there. And I haven't accounted for the size or the budget of the newspaper, but it's a great idea. I'm gonna look for that data, uh, like, I don't know, like operating budgets or things like that um, to include it. Um, and I also want to include to what uh, media conglomerate they belong, because probably that will also like tap into, into, into a bit of that concern. Thank you so much. Okay, we have another question from Maverick. Uh, did you run uh, heterogeneous effects analysis on the respondents to see if certain groups responded to the uh, picture in different way? Um, yes, uh, among race uh, or like my heterogeneous uh, treatment effect was black, non-black, non uh, but uh, I have such a small sample. It, I mean, not small sample, but it's 2000 and I already have different conditions. So I can't believe any of the results that I have there. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm not willing to present them <laughs> and be like, look, there's evidence here, but it suggests that they are definitely reacting differently. So you actually don't see a lot of um, um, treatment effects uh, among the African-American sample subsample because they already start with really high levels of skepticism about the police. So even if you just give them the text, they are like, no, they went too far. I don't even know what happened, but they went too far. Uh, and that's natural, right? Like that's like a predisposition that it's really hard to change. Uh, the changes occur mostly um, uh, in the in the white sample. So uh, I I that's it. I already purchased some some samples uh, that are like representative at the at the race level. So hopefully I will get more more information about that uh, very soon. Okay, we have a um, well, question in the chat uh, from uh, Sang Gwen Lui. Uh, amazing research. Uh, would there be any copyright issues or ethical issues you encounter when you use this data? And I assume the question is about uh, images, uh, copyright issues, I guess. Um, I don't think it's about experimental um, stuff, yeah. Yeah, no, and uh, I, I, I still, so, this paper is still under review, the one with the methods, for example. I try to make sure to include all of the, in the paper in general. Um, now in the presentation, no, because it would be too, too, too confusing to have a lot of the captions, but I'm definitely crediting all of them. Um, I will still have to probably pay um, some, some extra fees if I want to get them printed in, in, the, in, the, in the actual paper, if it, if it ever gets accepted. Um, uh, but but for some, for example, some of the things that I've used, uh, are, some of them come for the representation, for example, from Robert Cohen from the from the uh, St. Louis newspaper, the Post Dispatch, and I explicitly asked him to to use or like ask for permission to use his images, and he said it was fine, it was even fine to publish them or print them in the paper, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So my 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 idea will be to also uh, reach out to them. Um, when, when the time comes uh, for that. But for now, I'm crediting all of them and making sure that there's there's a full citation to whoever the photographer and the distributor of the image is. All right, I guess we don't have any more questions in the Q&A or chat. Oh, and can I say something super quick, Olga? Uh, and for the experiment, the, the pictures that I'm giving to the to my respondents, those are actually uh, open. They don't have any copyright imposed. That's why I'm using them. Um, and they are also coming from real protest of the Occupy movement. So that's that's another reason uh, that I chose them uh, because 
then there's no deception. Um, like it, newspapers were using them in different ways, uh, but 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 they were there. Someone published them to talk about the Occupy Movement protest. So I, I didn't come up with them or I wasn't lying about what happened there. Okay, pretty cool. Um, yeah, so I don't think we have any more questions unless someone asked in the last minute, but I want to kind of I've used the host powers and, and ask for my own question. So, um, uh, Michelle, is there a, a reason why you, uh, I mean, like, there's obviously like uh, certain uh, maybe like budgetary reasons, but why you went with um, uh, unsupervised rather than supervised um, learning approach? Uh, yes. That's that's a great, great, great question. And uh, I can talk for ages about it. So um, I really wanted topics. I was, I'm really convinced that the way in which I'm capturing framing is by uh, using this idea of topic in the image. And I want the distribution of those topics to really make sure that people are not just talking about one thing, one concept that I'm interested in using a method, a supervised method to classify, but to really in this, in this comparison of proportions. Um, so, I, I, the, and, and I also wanted to use these prevalence covariates to test my hypothesis. I'm a, I'm a fan of structural topic models because of that feature of like including and modeling the data generating process. So uh, in order to use that or to use that approach or that framework, um, I, it had to be on well, semi-supervised in that way. Like that, that the, the, semi, the, the supervision comes from the covariates, but uh, I, I, I really thought that was the best way to, to tackle my question. Um, I used the CNN to classify some things, but um, let me show you that. But the thing is that if I, if I train a supervised uh, CNN, for example, to, to detect whether there's a crowd or whether there's night, like these two images will have the same outcome, right? Oh, is there a crowd? Yes. If I train a, a CNN to give me that answer, it's going to be yes for both. But actually, these are very different images in my view of what visual framing means. This one is more focused on the people. This are one is more focused on the flag, on the identity, the symbolic identity depicted through the flags, right? So then a CNN wouldn't help me that much. Or then I will have to train an object detection uh, model to do it, but then you miss a lot of the things that are happening because it's not gonna be able to capture absolutely everything in the picture. So I thought that this approach was the most, like the cleaner and the easier to really capture what, what I was trying to, to study. Okay, that's very convincing. <laughs> uh, all right, we have, I guess, like uh, the a uh, couple minutes for the one last question before we wrap up. And uh, there is one in the Q&A from uh, Jean-Philippe uh, Coinet. Uh, thank you for the enlightening talk. And I was wondering whether you observed qualitative, um, uh, qualitatively different visual topics when running STM for different types of protests. Uh, so I haven't done it for different type of protests. This has all been um, for Black Lives Matter uh, separate from, I, I also, well, I, I also did it for Women's March, for example. And then yes, you, you for example, don't get the night activity topic there. I, I didn't did a joint analysis. That one was like with one sample and one sample one with different corpuses. Uh, and of course you observe different topics because for example, the Women's March, none of the protests happened at night. They were all during the day. So that topic just wouldn't exist. Fire either because, uh, there were there was no fire, but there was a topic: the pussy hats, the the pink hats everywhere, right? So um, you can definitely find different topics based on the different corpuses. Uh, now I can just give you like that piece of evidence from from these these two. Uh, but I, for example, haven't done it with the nationalist protest or other international protests. I've just focused on these two movements, and um, you definitely can see different frames there. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much again to the speaker, the host, and everybody who asked questions. And we look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Thanks and bye-bye. <laughs>